morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. Thank you, Mel, for those words about the and prayer for the persecuted church. Even though we were promised that that would come, it's still hard to face. And um, so thank you for doing that. Billy, thanks for good worship, for all the worship team. Uh, good worship this morning, and happy 4th of July weekend. Good of you to come out. I put on my 4th of July shirt, and uh, <laughs> I don't have one. There's really someone, where is he? Where is, there's Walt with the fancy, if he stood, we could salute because he's wearing the, he's wearing the flag. And, uh, and if he did it just right, we could all say the pledge because on the back of his shirt is the Pledge of Allegiance. So, amen. So, thank you for, for, thank you for that. It's a good, good day to be patriotic. So, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start a, a series, uh, well, we're kind of continuing through Ephesians, but we're specifically dealing now with the armor of God. And you'll notice that this is putting on the armor of God part 1. Uh, if you come next week, it'll be really creative uh, titling. It will be part two. Uh, and the week after that, part three. And you kind of get the point, uh, the direction for that. So I uh, hope you'll come at 11 uh, o'clock. I actually do know what we're going to do, so uh, I'm not in, in, in doubt about that. So if you come at 11, we're going to just spend some time. I want to show you some things that I use when I'm consulting with churches to kind of talk about where a church is at, how we kind of evaluate where we're at, where we need to go, and uh, let you in on some of that, and you can kind of help me with some of that. So it's going to be a good, I think, a good time and, and good time well spent. And I believe we're going to have some very good goodies, so that would be even maybe better. So let me, uh, open, let me open in prayer, and then let's, uh, let's get into the God's Word this morning. Father, thank you for... The privilege, <clears throat> the privilege that we have of coming before you, worshiping you, and thank you for these moments that we've had to, to worship you. We long for that day in heaven when that worship will not be just a matter of moments, but it will go on and on and on for hours, and it'll be so incredible and so joyous, and we look forward to those moments. Um, but in the meantime, we're grateful for those times here on earth when we can get a glimpse of what that might look like and what we think it might look like even in that day. So thank you for that, and thank you for the time that we've had to do that this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to look into your word. Uh, we're thankful that we have it. It's been given to us not only in its original languages, but in our languages today. We're able to understand it and study it and learn from it, and we thank you, Father, for that. So teach us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. June 6th, 1944, of course, was the, the infamous or the famous D-Day, the day that we invaded the Normandy beaches and the tide of World War II began to turn uh, more in the favor of the Allies. Uh, on June 6th, 1994, 50 years later, uh, there was, as you can imagine, in, in this country, great celebrations and great reflection on what that day looked like and what it was all about. One of, the news, one of the news medias that, uh, that handled that um, interviewed two different people back to back. And I wanted, I wanted to share with that because it sort of sets the stage for what we're going to talk about in even the spiritual warfare that we're going to look at in Ephesians. So one of the, one of the programs that did this, they first interviewed a Marine who landed on Omaha Beach on that day. And he recalled the horrors that sounded like Kind of sounded like scenes from Spielberg's Academy Award winning Saving Private Ryan. Uh, it was gruesome and, and uh, the aging veteran recalled looking around at the, the bloody casualties that were surrounding him and his conclusion was, we're, we're never going to get out of this. We're going to lose. Uh, we're in a losing, losing battle. And many, I think, felt that way. The next interview, however, was with the U.S. Army Corps re reconnaissance pilot who had flown over the whole battle area. And he viewed the, the, the carnage on the beaches on the, and on the hills. Uh, but he also witnessed the, su the successes of the Marines, the penetration of the paratroopers, and the effectiveness of the aerial bombard bombardments that were taking place. He looked at everything that was happening, and he concluded, we're going to win. Uh, it all depends on perspective, doesn't it? Not all. I mean, there was obviously some skill that went involved in that battle, too. But a lot of it depends on the perspective so when we're looking even at something as um, significant as the armor of God, we look at it from a couple of different perspectives. We look at it at the great need that we have to wear the armor because we recognize that we are in a battle and it is a battle in which the enemy is powerful. 
But if we look at it from another perspective, we also know that even though we are in the midst of the battle and those battles are real and there are casualties in those battles and there's carnage and all of those things, if you look at it from another spiritual perspective, we also know that the war has already been won. So there's, there's, there's both sides of that, much like any other battle that's fought. And I think it's, it's just kind of important for us to, to keep that in mind and to bear that in mind as we even go through the various pieces of the armor and the armament that we're going to talk about. We understand that the enemy that we're facing is powerful. Uh, Satan is, is powerful. There's no, no question and no doubt about that. But we also understand that God is much more powerful than the enemy. And so one of the questions as I began to study this passage out, and we're looking specifically at Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. We're, we listed the passage all the way through verse 20, where actually that would be incredibly optimistic to make it to 20. Uh, we'll be, we're, we're hoping, I'm kind of hoping by the end of the day we've made it through 14. So uh, we're going to get through a couple of verses. But uh, when, we look, when we look at that, one of the questions that comes up, and it's, it's kind of a, a theological question that we face in some of the uh, views that we have of Scripture, one of the questions is, if we are really in Christ and we're standing in Christ, why do we really need the armor? There are those who believe that if in this world all you need to do is stand firm in Christ and let him completely fight the battles. So all we need to do is in the midst of a struggle just say, in the name of Jesus and, and whatever, and, and it's over. He takes, he takes care of everything. We don't have to do anything. Uh, and you've, heard, you've probably heard that viewpoint. If we just had more faith, if we were just standing more firm, we could move that mountain or we could heal that disease or we could face that battle and we would win and everything would be fine. The, the problem is we also know in we, as we look at life that it doesn't often work out that way. Um, and it isn't always a matter of not having enough faith or not standing in the right place at the right time. Because it would seem to me that the balance of Scripture is that we, we do stand firm in the Lord. And yes, there are times when that is all that is needed because he will just completely come in and wipe out the enemy and move us forward. But there are also times when he says, but I have armed you for battle. Stand firm. Wear the armor. Understand what your role in all of this is. And so it seems to me that even as we come to Ephesians and Paul is talking about how we are to be imitators of God and we're to walk, we're to walk worthy of the manner in which he has, he has called us to do, that part of that calling and part of that, that whole responsibility is to understand our role in fighting the enemy and fighting the battle. Ultimately, of course, the battle belongs to the Lord and ultimately the victory belongs to him. But we can either become part of the battle force or we can become part of the carnage. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with how we approach and how we uh, handle the scripture and how we handle the armor and how we handle some of those things. So the first thing we need to understand about this armor is that this armor is, is there for our fighting, but it is, there, it is there because God has given us this armor. This is not armor that we went out and bought in some store that we kind of figured out where we should get it and what we should have. It is, this is armor that has come from God. It is important for us to understand that while there is no magic formula for winning these things, there is strength in the armor that he gives us. And it is armor that he puts on us and clothes us with, and it is indicative of, of what we need uh, in our lives. So there is, we need that power. We're to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, but we stand biblically on that armor in which he puts upon us and in which he arms us with and puts, and puts us in that place. So that's important uh, for us to know. If we don't, if we just assume that we can stand by, kind of do what we got, want, and God will take care of everything else, there is a verse in the Bible for that one, isn't there? Uh, let, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed, what? Lest he fall. Uh, we get prideful, we get arrogant, we think we've got it all, we think we don't need this, we don't, we can kind of, we're kind of beyond that, or God will take care of us, and that's exactly when the enemy can come in, and we have, we don't have the power that we think we did. There are examples all through scripture of people who thought they had it together, 
and somehow in those moments let the armor kind of fade or slip. I think of David, in, there's a couple of times in, in David's life, certainly the time with Bathsheba would have been one of them, but there's another time when he kind of let, the, let all of that slip when he was not to take his sins and sin, he took it anyway. And he just kind of said, I'm going to do this my way, and God will take care of everything. Well, God did, but not in probably the way he was thinking. Peter, you'll remember, uh, Lord, everyone may deny you, but I won't. Uh, I got this. And what happened? Within hours, he denied him. So we need to understand that we are facing um, an enemy that is not only powerful, but he's very subtle. Uh, and therefore, his methods vary, his weapons vary, he learns, things, get, things move on, and it gets uh, careful. We need to be very careful to not take anything in this whole armor area uh, for, for granted. And we need to understand there that we need to put on the whole armor. We're going to get into the individual pieces in a, in a few moments, but we need to put on the whole armor of God. There, that, that's what Paul says, does he not? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Now, he gives us six pieces of that armor, and there is some debate whether that is totally inclusive or whether there could be other pieces, and I don't know that that's a huge debate that needs to be taken. These six are certainly essential, and maybe at times he gives us even, even some others, but this, Paul says, is enough to be considered the whole armor. And, and so we're going to, we're going to put on, a, we're going to gird our, 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 our loins, we're going to have a, a belt of of truth. We're going to have a breastplate of righteousness. We're going to have a sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We're going to have other things that are going to be put on, and they're, they're there to protect us from the enemy, uh, from the onslaught of the enemy. We need the armor to protect us. It is clearly more defensive than it is offensive, but there is an offensive side as well. Does that make sense? You guys are listening really well this morning. Uh, we've been provided everything that we need in this armor. It is complete. Maybe at times he'll throw in another piece that we might need, but essentially this, this is enough to do what we need to do on an everyday basis. And this, I think, as I thought about this, I thought, what does this mean that we have been given the whole armor of God that we can withstand in the evil day? It seems, it seems to me that this should bring us both uh, comfort and encouragement. It should comfort us to know that, that God has, in his, in his foresight and in his thinking about what we are going to need in life, he has provided something for us that he says, you're going to need this. Here it is. I'm going to give it to you. Uh, put it on. Wear it. it is, it's a comfort to know that God's already thought of the fact that I'm going to be in battle and I'm going to need this. Uh, he's, he's ahead of me on this one. He already knows, in fact, he already, need, already knows where in that armor the enemy is most likely to attack me because he knows my weaknesses. He knows where I'm the most feeble. He knows where I'm the most vulnerable. And he's already taken steps to protect that. So it is both a comfort and an encouragement to know that he has, he has done that. Whatever we may need in this life to confront the struggles and the battles that we're going to face, he has already provided for us. So we essentially face nothing in this world that he is not already aware of and has already provided the tools that we need to overcome it. Isn't that incredible? We still, we still fail uh, because of who we are and because we don't, we don't often follow things the way we have probably have ought to have done. And sometimes we think that instead of the armor, uh, one commentator uh, pointed out, sometimes we get this idea that maybe, you know, we're, we're pretty smart. Uh, you know, God's given us a brain. And so sometimes it, we can just reason with Satan. We can just kind of reason with the enemy and we can kind of talk him out of things and get, get our own way. Has anyone found that to ever work? It's, it's sort of like... Um, and I don't want to go too deeply into this, but it's sort of like trying to reason with a politician. Do you ever win? <laughs> well, that's as far as we'll go into that. <laughs> uh, it, it's, you, there's just times it just doesn't work. It's not, going to be, it's not going to be the thing that's going to make it. And so we have this armor that he's given us, and instead of being actual, I mean, it's given to us Many people think that Paul was probably looking up at the soldier that was, that was uh, uh, guarding him in, in Rome when he wrote this, 
and looking up at him and looking at the various pieces and then making spiritual input about them. And, and that's probably true. But we need to understand that it, rather than being actual physical pieces of armor, he's talking about spiritual, spiritual things that we need to fight the enemy. And so we need truth and we need righteousness and we need faith, and we need salvation, and we need the gospel of peace, and we need all of those things. So we need to understand that while these are viewed as pieces, and you know, various times we, we put up, and, you know, I, I tried to go online to find a, a picture of a good, uh, of a soldier with all of these pieces, and I couldn't, I couldn't find one I liked. So I didn't, you know, there's none up there, because I, I couldn't, they all looked kind of weird. But, um, so I didn't do it. But that's the, that's the picture that we often have when in reality these are really spiritual things, which means, which, means, which means this as we enter into this discussion. This is armor that is designed for a Christian. That's important to note uh, because if you do not know Jesus Christ, this armor won't do you any good. Uh, if you are a Christian, this, this is for you. So if you have come to that place where you have repented of your sin, you've understood that you're a sinner, that you cannot save yourself, that the cross is for you, that you've come to that place where you've understood that Jesus died for your sin and you've embraced that and personalized that in your life and you've confessed that with your mouth, believed it in your heart, and you are truly a believer in Jesus Christ, then this is for you. If not, that needs to happen first because th this just won't, it won't, it won't engage. These are spiritual, this is spiritual armor designed for those of us who know Jesus Christ. So if you're not a believer, it's just simply not going to work. So we put on the whole armor. The other thing about that, the other point, and then we're actually going to get into the armor. We really are. We, we will get there. Hang in there. Um, is that we have, to, we have to put on the whole thing. We don't get to pick and choose. We, we are, you know, we kind of maybe as just as people because people are people or maybe because we've lived, we live in a, in a free society so long, I don't know. We, we just sort of have this idea that we can, like, a shopping, like going shopping, we can pick and choose what we want of our spiritual life and put on the things we want and ignore the things we don't want. And we can kind of go for the ones that really look more cool, you know. And so, you know, if I were going for it, I'd probably want a sword, you know, because those are really cool. Uh, but, you know, I mean, who wants a belt, you know, so some of those things, but the, the point that Paul is saying here is you, you got to put the whole thing on. It, it's, you, you have to wear it all. You don't get to pick and choose. It's, it's, we need to understand that and understand that that's part of what we lean into. All right, with that, let's, let's plug into the two pieces we're going to look at today. We're going to look at just two, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. The belt of truth. Uh, we wear, you know, we wear belts today for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, looks, you know, kind of, it, it, you can't see mine because I'm wearing a cool Santa Barbara shirt today, but um, that's what somebody called this. It's the Santa Barbara shirt. Really, it isn't. But um, belts are kind of cool. Um, in some cases, they hold your pants up. Um, in some cases, that's not such a big deal. Um, it would be if, they were, if it wasn't working, of course. But... Um, in that day, it was really more of a girdle. It was a, it was a little bit bigger than just the kind of belt that we would use for fashion. It's more of a girdle. And the, the old King James says it was there to gird your loins, which is kind of a strange phrase. But the, the concept was that you wore it around your, your waist. And because most men and soldiers even in that day wore robes that kind of made it all the way to the ground, if you were going to run, have you ever tried to run in a bathrobe? I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I've not, I don't know that I've actually ever tried it. Uh, but it didn't work too well. So you, they would take, the, they would take the, uh, the robe and they would tuck it into that, into that girdle and they would kind of tuck everything into that. And all, ultimately, the breastplate of righteousness got tucked into that, that girdle. The sword was hung on that. So it, kind of, it, was that, it was that piece of the garment, that piece of the armor that kind of held everything else together. So it was, it was, some say, it was probably the most important piece in terms of its, of its use, of its effectiveness of all that it did. It may not have protected in some areas like the breastplate of righteousness would or like the sandals where you get to run or some of those kinds of things, but it is absolutely, uh, absolutely essential that we have 
something that kind of holds everything else together. So very, very important for us. So it, it helps prepare us for battle. It's that one piece that kind of gets everything ready to run into battle. So it speaks of readiness. It speaks of, of being um, prepared. It speaks of having all of those things in place, having on the right uniform uh, ready for us to go. Um, so Paul is saying that truth is this piece. For us as a believer, truth is that thing which holds everything else together. So what is, what is he referring to? Well, I think he's referring to certainly the truth of the Scriptures, is he not? Uh, I think that's a pretty obvious thing. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Uh, it is the truth. It is the whole truth of the Word of God. Now, in a little, a little bit later, he's going to say to pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So is, is that a different, are there two different things he's talking about? And I think there is a differentiation between the two. They're both speaking about the Word of God. But I think when he's talking here about the truth, he's talking about the whole counsel of God. He's talking about understanding the whole story of Scripture, the whole concept of Scripture, the, the grand truths, the grand story, understanding the doctrines, the doctrine of inerrancy and, and the Trinity and all of those things which are so important because when we get into battle, the more we understand about the whole counsel of God, the easier it is to apply that whole counsel of God to the situation that we're in. When he talks about the sword of the Spirit, which we'll talk about later, I think there he may be referring to maybe individual scriptures, uh, individual places in the scriptures that are needed to fight off the enemy at certain points. For instance, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, Satan came to him and tempted him with power, with all of these things. What was it Jesus said? It is written, thou shalt not, and then whatever, he filled in the blank. He took specific scriptures and applied them to a specific situation. I think that's the sword of the Spirit being applied in that situation, where I think here he's talking about the grand truth of Scripture. So as believers, one of the key things that we keep working on, that I keep, I keep hammering on and have done through most of my life in ministry, is we need to understand and know the Word of God. There's, there's no shortcut to that. Um, and and I, as, as, as I have said enough to probably get, you get bored hearing it over and over again, if the only input you get is from this on Sunday morning, you're, you're going to be short. You, you need to get into it yourself. You need to understand it. You need to uh, spend time with it and read it and understand it and read some of the theologies and, and, and get into it. And we don't have a lot of necessarily as much of that today as we perhaps used to focus on that. And so it's good. Um, I hope this won't get me in too much trouble. But it, it's good to listen to other preachers. And, I, and we, you can go on YouTube and you can listen to preachers all, all day long. Many of them are good. Some of them are borderline. Um, won't go, uh, don't ask me to rate them. But listen, you know, Swindoll is good. See, now I'm doing it. Um, and some of those, and I, I come into church sometimes, and you're people, oh, did you hear Jeremiah this morning? Did you hear this morning? You hear this? That, that's wonderful. That's great. But listen, folks, that's fine. But there is no substitute for you getting into the Word of God yourself and studying the truths yourself instead of just getting somebody else's digestion of it. There's no substitute for that. Uh, I know men, you know, I think of my own, my, own, my own dad, my own grandfather who would not have been considered by many world standards to be highly educated or, or learned men, but they, they went to Sunday school every week, they attended church every week, and in those days they had a Sunday school lesson they had to do, and they had, they had studies they had to do and fill out and prepare before they went, and so they were into the Word of God before they went to Sunday school and studied it and, and talked about it and explained it. And because of that, over the years of doing that, year after year after year, they, they gained the knowledge of having studied the Word of God themselves. And then coming together and talking about it and learning from one another. Absolutely. Um, but you don't get it all just by someone else telling you. 
as much as you do yourself. Martin Luther, I didn't know this until I saw this in print earlier this week. Martin Luther is said to have memorized the entire Bible in Latin. In Latin. Of course, that would have been the, the language of the Bible when he was around in that day. But he memorized, supposedly memorized the entire Bible in Latin. How, how, how much have you memorized? How much have I memorized? Kind of scary. John Wesley memorized most of the Greek New Testament. I, I can't even read Greek very well anymore, but he memorized the, the, much of the New Testament in Greek. We don't, we don't focus a lot on memorization these days. Um, and I, I, I feel bad about that, and we're going to talk about that at some point in some level in, in our organizational structure. But uh, having, having memorized it, they're then able to live it out in their daily lives. See, it's not just memorized to memorize. It's memorized because the more you memorize, the more it, you can then meditate. And the more you can meditate, the more it begins to influence how you live. And so it's important to get the Word of God into your life in your way so that you can apply the truth of the Scriptures around you. It is one of the strongest and, uh, and most effective weapons that we have. Without it, none of the others really work very well. And we'll, we'll talk in a few moments about the breastplate of righteousness, and you can put that thing on, and that's really good, and we're righteous in God's eyes, and there's some whole things about that, but there's some pieces of that that aren't going to work very well if you don't know God's Word. And how are you going to share Christ with other people if you don't know His Word? And how are you going to bring peace to the world if you don't know God's Word? And how, how are you going to, how it all comes back to, do you know God's Word? And we claim to be a church of the Word. And I believe we are. But it also, if most many of us who have kind of been around a while have studied things and believe that we're also probably in, in, in this country, at least, in, one of, in a situation where the church is probably the most illiterate it's ever been in terms of what it actually knows about the Word of God. We are, we're, we're, we're sucked away into all of the things of the world. Um, and so there's, there's many things, there's, there's many that are very deeply concerned about the level of understanding that are the common, the average person in the pew has today about God's word. Um, it's just, it's often not there. Paul uh, expressed concern back, uh, remember in the book of Acts, he was speaking to the Ephesian uh, leaders and he was um, getting ready to say his goodbyes to them. And so he says in verse 28, pay it, in verse chapter 20 of Acts, verse 28, pay attention, pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, remain alert. Uh, part of the, the job that we have as leaders is to make sure that the, the level of understanding is where it needs to be and to be on, on the alert. We can get to the place where many people today, and I, I, I don't mean to pick on us, but I guess I am. Many people today, and I've run into many Christians today who can't differentiate between a, a, a good, solid, uh, biblical preacher and one who's, who's preaching error. They, they can't dif differentiate the two. They, can't, they don't catch it. Why? Because somewhere we've not gotten the Word of God so that they can differentiate truth from error. And it's a, it's a, big, it's a big danger in our world today. So it starts with salvation. Obviously, it moves into this whole area of the truth of the Word of God. And, and so I, I want to be more of an encouragement than just kind of beat us up. But you can, sometimes you've got to do a little bit of both. Uh, but we... We need to ask ourselves, where, where are we in understanding and studying the Word of God? Um, there are people, and we can sit in groups, and there are, I can get lost real quickly in when we get into the discussion of video games, and, some, and I'm not picking up video games, or TV, current TV shows, or movies, or some of those things. I know I live in the, you know, the center of the entertainment industry, I get that. But I, there's a lot of that that I get real lost on real quick because I just don't follow it. I don't have time to follow that as maybe as much as I should. I don't know. But 
Uh, but given the choice, I think I would rather spend some time here than there. Um, and it's a challenge. This, this, is, this is one of the areas where the enemy gets us. Um, and where we, we, we get to that place where we think we know enough. And therefore, I'm good. Yeah, I get the basic ideas. Um, we never stop growing in our understanding of the Word of God. Um, and enough said. Second one is the breastplate of, of righteousness. Um, this is an interesting one because our righteousness comes completely from God, does it not? So we have none in ourselves, right? We, we have zip when it comes to righteousness in and of ourselves. That, I think, is what Isaiah 65 says when it says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All of our righteousness are like filthy rags. And stand up. Paul says in Romans, there is none righteous, not one. There is righteous, but there is a righteousness that comes from God. So God puts on his righteousness on us. So it comes from him. So the, the, the righteousness that we do have, this righteousness that is the breastplate of righteousness comes from him. It protects our vital organs. I mean, it's, it's very placed very carefully. You know, in a, a real breastplate, uh, you know, protects the heart and the liver and the spleen and lungs and all of those other things that are in there, uh, whatever they are. Uh, that's all protected by those. God puts those on us, and therefore it is received, this righteousness is received through faith in Jesus Christ. He clothes us with righteousness. Scriptures are very, very clear on that. So if that's true, then how does this really work for us? Where, where does this fit in as one of the, the pieces of our, of our armor? And so I think the first thing we have to understand is that it comes, it's not from us, it comes from God. It, he made, uh, God made him to, who was no sin to be sin for us so that we might become his righteousness. That's the verse that comes with that. And in that, we then have to understand that as, we be, as his righteousness is in us or on us, we eventually kind of live into it. So if, if we are righteous and that righteousness comes from him, then the more we continue to uh, denounce dependence upon ourselves and depend on him, the more that righteousness infuses or imputes into our life is the theological term, imputed to us. And as that happens, it begins to affect how we live and we begin to reflect his righteousness around us. So the, the best we really ever get to do is reflect it. Uh, we, we live righteously because we have his righteousness in us. And so it becomes an important piece of the armor because when Satan comes to attack us, we have to understand when those attacks come, we have to say, but Satan, you're trying to attack me, and it's really you're attacking him. I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't have the righteousness to defeat you, but he does. So we, when we get into the battle and we get into the, the fierceness of the battle with the enemy, our, our dependence, we get into prayer and dependence upon him because we go, dear Father, we're, I'm in a spot that I, I can't, I, I don't know what to do. You are the one who can do this. I'm going to depend on you, not on my own righteousness because I have none. Does that make sense? So it becomes a real, a real dependence issue on, on who we are. I don't know if that covered all the slides. I'm not sure how I did that. Did we cover them all? Awesome. Um, I depend on this, them to figure all that out. So this is something the truth and the righteousness kind of come together. We understand the righteousness the more we understand the truth, to be sure. But as we, as we kind of bring this to a close, the, the questions that, that seem like they need to come to our hearts and to our minds uh, go back to where we spend our time, where we spend our energy, and who we depend on. Um, and I think we have, I think every one of us can look at our own lives and say, where in my life can I carve out more time to spend with Jesus and his word? 
I'm not asking people to give up everything they've ever had or to, or to you, know, uh, no, you know, throw the TV away or any of those things. I, I'm not asking you to do that. But, you know, do we need to really watch the news for eight hours a day? God help us if we do. But, I mean, you know, you can get most of it in about 20 minutes. From there, it's just everybody else telling you what they think about it. Um, so do we need to watch show after show after show, or can we maybe turn that off once in a while and spend some time in the Word? Can we make sure we spend some time reading some deeper kinds of things? It's good to have devotions. It's good to have a, a quiet time and to read some of the, the things that help us understand that. But, you know, every now and then it's maybe good to read something that's kind of a little bit deeper, kind of dig into it a little bit. Um, and... Uh, and, and spend some time doing that, deep in our thinking and our process about the whole counsel of God. Uh, it, is, it is there that we be, and you know, sometimes you think, well, you know, but I, I'm not going to be a pastor or a missionary. What do I need to do that for? Well, because you're going to be in the battle. Hurt, doesn't hurt to know that stuff, uh, some of those things, and things that we uh, often have known. And are, are we depending on my own righteousness, or am I depending upon Christ's righteousness. When I depend on my own, then I begin to think, yeah, I got this. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I know this and this, and I memorize this. And that. See, the, the, day, the, the flip side of the truth, learning the truth, is that it can lead us to become arrogant. And we've all run into those guys too, those people that, you know, they know everything, they know verse after verse after verse, and they, they throw it at you the most inopportune times. Uh, or they, they go out and they beat people over the head with it, or those kinds of things. So to know the truth is then also to learn some humility that says, even though I know this, God, I know that still my righteousness comes from you, not from me. Uh, I still can't do this on my own. I, there, I don't know how to do this. And as long as I've been doing it, I still don't know how to do it. I still have to depend on him to be righteous for me because I can't do it on my own. If we can start to get those kinds of things down, we'll, we'll keep work, working through the rest of the armor as well. But these are two great starters to get us moving in the right direction. And I, I challenge you this morning to, to think through your life and think, where can I spend more time in God's word? And where have I become maybe a little bit arrogant or a little bit self-righteous thinking, I've got this. And where do I need to take that to the Lord and say, I, I need to repent of that because this is all about you. It's not about me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. And Father, I, I, I hope I've been more of an encouragement than a, than a, than a uh, naysayer this morning. But we do need to challenge some of these things that we just kind of slowly let creep into our lives. Many times not even, not even realizing that's what we're doing. And, and in time, the time with you begins to slip away into fewer and fewer moments every day. Don't mean to do that, I don't think, but it just begins to happen. So help us take inventory of our lives and see where, where can we work to find more time to let you and your word influence our lives and the way we live. Where, can we, where have we become a little bit self-righteous and where do we need to turn that back over to you and allow you to work in our lives and, and once again declare our utter dependency upon you? Guide us in this today, Father, we pray. And we'll thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me as we get ready for the benediction. Thank you so much for coming this morning. We are going to take a little bit of a break uh, we'll meet a few minutes after 11 back in here and kind of go over some things together at the time that I'll be leading. Meanwhile, I think we have some goodies that are, should be ready or will be ready in a few moments. If you're new with us, we would love to get to know you a little bit. I'll be back there and some of the welcome team will be back there as well. I think they're going to be outside as well. There's a couple of sign-up tables, I think, that are supposed to be people to sign up. So do that if you need to do that. And uh, hope that you'll have a great day, a great Fourth of July holiday. And uh, we'll hope to see you again next Sunday. Now receive this as our benediction this morning. And now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ask or think, 
according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks again for coming. Have a great, great afternoon.